it is 5.30, I'll call the meeting to order. I'll rise for a Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, the agenda I know we have a couple of amendments to the agenda um, first is on the workforce housing Mike did you want to uh, talk about the workforce housing amendment there thank you mayor I would have two amendments to recommend to council tonight first as you indicated mayor on the workforce housing the current assignee of the purchase agreement has negotiated a 90-day extension on the due diligence period which allows us to extend the RFP deadline uh, we're thinking 31st of December. That provides an additional three weeks for developers to contemplate the project and submit back to us their concept. So uh, if you'd be willing to add that to the agenda for consideration, we would certainly recommend to do so. Okay, where would we put that? Really anywhere, Mayor. You could put it as the first item under administration, uh, or you could put it under finance, either either place as a separate standalone item. Your call. Um, let's put it under finance since nothing is under administration right now. Okay. Second item, Mayor, we would recommend uh, item 12A to be postponed. Ashley is finalizing contract language negotiations with Northern Hills Technology. We hoped that the contract would be ready for consideration tonight and it's not quite ready yet. So. Uh, if you're willing to postpone that item to 2 December, we would recommend to do so. Okay. Okay, so we have those two amendments. Anything else that I am not aware of? Okay, is there a motion to approve with uh, changes? Okay. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next, we have um, any <coughs> conflicts of interest to declare. Hearing none, we will move on to the consent agenda. Move to approve. Second. Aye. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, items from visitors. Um, we have Carol Thorstensen here with us for the presentation of the 2018 audit reports. <laughs> Nice to see you again, Shelley. Good evening. Can you hear me? Not used to talking into a mic, sorry. Okay, good evening. I'm Shelley Goodrich, Audit Director with Cato Thorstensen. We came in to do the 2018 audit this year. <coughs> Obviously, you've had some light reading here. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll go over this very high level. We did meet during field work with um, mayor, administrator, Michelle and likely Dave at the time and talk through the details and things like that. So this will be really high level. Um, first of all, thank you for having us back. Thank you for letting us come in and ask mountains of questions and get information, but your crew is always very easy to work with and nice to work with. Um, from an opinion perspective, you'll see that all of the funds presented have a clean opinion across the board. When we give this opinion, we give reasonable, but not absolute assurance over that opinion. And I'm on page four, if you're following along. <laughs> what that means is that we do a lot of testing, we walk through transactions, we get comfortable with why things went up or went down, but we don't look at all of the transactions that happened. So that's where we get our reasonable, but not our absolute assurance. We are independent in that any of the other services that we may offer at our firm don't um, cause any independence issues with us coming in and doing the audit for all of you. And uh, throughout this process, this report has gone to the state, to the Department of Legislative Audit for their review. So that process has been done and any comments or changes have been made. 
from a findings perspective, we had four overall findings, which would be a comparable number to last year. Um, three of those four findings are exact repeats from last year from the standpoint that we prepare your financial statements. We posted a few journal entries along the way. The um, state law issue with the negotiable CDs that are out there, that's a repeat. And then we just had some um, documentation we couldn't quite follow all the way through from a fee perspective when we were looking at a level site transaction. But that's part of what we do. We come in and look at the different revenue streams and is all the documentation there and things like that. So if you want to add anything, Michelle, go ahead. Nothing to add? No. <coughs> So um, overall, I, I'm not going to go through the details of the funds. Overall, the city has a strong, positive net position, and the overall opinion on the audit was clean. So I'd be happy to field any more specific questions. Otherwise, uh, with your approval, we'll go ahead and finalize. Any questions? Okay, none here. Is there uh, a motion to accept? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Have Very a good day. night. And thank you, Michelle. Nice clean audit. Uh, next, we have a presentation on the Thonestone right of way. Hello. Hi, Mayor, Council. Uh, Roger Tellinghusen, uh, formerly from Spearfish, <laughs> currently from Rapid. <laughs> My assistant, uh, Van, I mean Les Turgeon here, uh, is handing out um, some exhibits that I'd like to go over with you as I make this short presentation. But let me just start out by saying that we really do appreciate the opportunity to make our case, if you will, before the council. Um, this is an issue that uh, has probably been batted around for some time in different ways and different means. We really do appreciate the opportunity to address you. For those of you that aren't real familiar with what the Thone Stone is, um, it's a slab of sandstone that measures approximately eight inches wide by 10 inches long, it's about three inches thick, that was discovered in 1887 by Lewis Thone at the base of Lookout Mountain. And on that stone tablet was inscribed uh, basically a story on one side that described uh, some prospectors that came to this area, found gold, were attacked by Native Americans, and the lone survivor at that time, Ezra Kind, scratched out um, that little story, and then on the other side, the names <clears throat> of the prospectors that were in that party, and that was 1833. The phone stone itself actually is in the Adams Museum in Deadwood, for anyone that um, hasn't seen it. It's, it's an interesting piece of history. Well, in 1953, uh, Frank Thompson, resident of Spearfish, who owned a fair chunk of land, if you will, just south of where the Passion Play is, decided that it was appropriate to have a monument commemorating that, that, that finding, that historical document that was found. And so <clears throat> Frank, in 1953, gave to the city of Spearfish and to the Thone Stone Committee um, and to the uh, State Historical Society in easement. And that's Exhibit 1. Like, if you wouldn't mind pulling that up, please. I've given each of you a copy of the 13, or the, the 13 exhibits that I intend to go through very quickly tonight, so that if you ever want to go back <coughs> and look at it more closely, uh, you'd be able to do that. It's kind of hard to do that when it's just on a jump drive that I'm going to take with me when I leave tonight. So I'll leave the exhibits with you. But I've highlighted some of the pertinent parts of each of these documents, so uh, I'm just going to run through those rather quickly. But on July 9th, 1953, Frank Thompson had a dedication ceremony. Uh, he also gave this easement. And the, the part about this easement that I think is, is important to note is it's an easement for a knoll ground containing about two acres together with the gravel right-of-way, 25 feet wide for purposes of displaying the Thone Stone marker. Uh, this was signed not only by Mr. Thompson and the members of the Thone Stone Committee, but also by the mayor of Spearfish at that time, uh, Mr. Sullivan. 
attached as Exhibit 2 is just a picture out of Frank Thompson's book that was taken at the time of the dedication, and it shows Mr. Thompson all the way over to the left, as well as the marker itself, and then in the distance you can see uh, the base of Lookout Mountain, where now some of you maybe have noticed, and oftentimes I think maybe we drive by it too fast, but there's a big white X at the base of Lookout Mountain, and that was the location where the Thone Stone was uh, allegedly found by Lewis Thone in, in 1887. <clears throat> Fast forwarding uh, to 1971, I'd like to have you turn to Exhibit 3, if you would, please. What this is is a plat, and Mike, there, thank you, and if you could maybe make it just a little bit larger, there we go. This is a plat that Mr. Thompson had prepared that actually created three lots, 37A down at the bottom, which is where the Thone Stone Monument itself is now, 37B, which was the bulk of this land, and 37C. To kind of orientate you a little bit, 37C is in the vicinity of what would be the end at that time of St. Joe Street. It was actually called Second Avenue at one time, but it later became known as St. Joe Street. And this was a, a plat that was prepared on behalf of Mr. Uh, Thompson in 1971. And if you turn to the exhibit number four, what you'll find is an agreement that was entered into on November 15th, excuse me, November 30th, 1971, between Frank Thompson and the city of Spearfish. And specifically, by virtue of this agreement, Frank Thompson conveyed Lot 37A, the site of the Thonestone Monument, to the city of Spearfish. Also, he granted to the city of Spearfish, as you see down at the bottom of that page that's highlighted in yellow, a right-of-way 40 feet in width to provide access to that site. But the real important part about this document, in my opinion as a lawyer, is that it also provides the city agrees to maintain that road in perpetuity. And if the city quits using this area as a city park or adhering to this agreement, the land reverts back to the Thompson family. Now, so since 1971, um, this agreement has been in effect. And you'll note on the last page of that document, the signature of Donald E. Young, who was the mayor of Spearfish at the time. So this wasn't just a grant that was given to the city by Mr. Thompson. It was not only a grant given to the city by Mr. Thompson, it was a grant that was accepted by the city, as well as the maintenance responsibilities for that road. If you turn to exhibit number five, you'll find the warranty deed that Mr. Thompson gave on November 30th, 1971, to the city of Spearfish for lot 37. In completion of the agreement that was entered into between Mr. Thompson and the City of Spearfish. Exhibit six, exhibit 6 shows that Mr. Thompson subdivided that lot 37C into two parcels, lot 37C1 and lot 37C2. I can't tell you exactly why he did it, but I think we find some explanation for it in exhibit number 7 which is another deed from Mr. Thompson to the city of Spearfish where he conveyed lot 37C from that preceding plat to the city of Spearfish. And note what I've highlighted at the very end of the first paragraph. For the use and purpose of maintaining a road to provide access to the Thonestone Monument Road. Same road that the city of Spearfish agreed in 1971 that it would continue to maintain. Turning to exhibit number nine, I included this in this packet of exhibits. It's a resolution adopted by the city of Spearfish in 1980 where it annexed the land described in this resolution, Tract 1, to orientate you. Tract 1 was approximately 60 plus acres that lies south of the, the property where the Thone Stone Monument is located. Um, it was owned by Yvonne Ward until recently, and recently acquired by the Booth Fish Hatchery uh, Historical, is it Historical Society? Okay, Booth Society. They now own it. But the access to that Tract 1 is through the Throne Stone Road. <coughs> it's the only access to it. 
1983, you'll see by virtue of exhibit number nine, the Thompson heirs, George Thompson, Edith Malcolm, and, and Monty Harwood. I'm not sure if Monty, was Monty out uh, there? Was he too? Oh, okay. Um, they conveyed lot 37B, which was the bulk of the property between that strip that was conveyed to the city for 37C2 and 37A, where the monument is located. They conveyed that to Joseph Meyer. And again, the Thonestone Road provides access to that property. Turning to exhibit number 10 is another resolution that was adopted by the city of Spearfish um, in 2011, where the city of Spearfish took this area and established what's now known as the Thonestone Addition to the city of Spearfish. And if you turn back to the third page of that exhibit, you'll see all of the lots, thank you Mike, you'll see all of the lots that were identified in that resolution to constitute the Thonestone Addition to the city of Spearfish, as well as the road. That road provides the only access to Lot 37A and the property beyond. Turning to exhibit number uh, 11, it's a big plat. Um, I don't know how well that will, I might be able to make it a little bigger, but all of you have a copy of it. What's interesting about this document, it was, it's a plat that was approved in 2012 by the city of Spearfish, but it was the city of Spearfish and Johanna Meyer Dovecchia and her husband Guido Dovecchia that were the owners of all of the property covered by this plat at that time. And they are the ones that platted this and dedicated, as you can see, a 70 foot wide public right of way which is the Thonestone Road. Now that 70 foot wide right of way <coughs> encompasses and includes, when you look at this closely, you can see where the original 40 foot easement that I referred to earlier is actually located within this, this 70 foot right of way. And what's notable about this plat, in my opinion, is that it not only extends from the end of St. Joe's Street in Spearfish, but it goes all the way down to the section line of the, at the south end. Again, it's what provides access to track one, which is over on what you're looking at to the right, as well as the additional property that lies beyond that, most of which is owned by Johanna Meyer Dalvecchia, but a portion of which, 40 acres, is owned by my clients, Karen and Les Turgeon. I attached a couple of other documents that, that aren't necessarily in the chain of title, but I thought they were important to bring to your attention. Exhibit number 12, it's Covenants, Restrictions, and Easements, and you'll note that it was a, a document prepared on behalf of Claire Meyer by her daughter, Johanna Meyer Delvecchia. And what these covenants do is they, they were covenants that were put on property owned <coughs> by Claire Meyer what is the face of Lookout Mountain. She put those covenants on this property before she gifted those 103 plus acres on the face of Lookout Mountain to the city of Spearfish. And the purpose behind putting those covenants on there was to make sure there was no development ever on the face of Lookout Mountain. That was a condition of the gift to the city of Spearfish. But what's also notable is that what says, let it be further known that this property is being gifted by Claire Meyer to the city of Spearfish in perpetuity, as long as the city, A, takes no action to remove the Thone Stone <coughs> Monument from its present location near the Passion Playgrounds and continues maintenance of the present road and continues previous signings to the current Thone Stone. The city has accepted that gift. And it would be our contention, quite respectfully, that in doing so, the city also accepted the obligation to maintain, not necessarily improve, and we'll talk about that, but maintain the Thonestone Road for the benefit of the public to whom that road was dedicated for their use. <coughs> I have 
one more exhibit attached to this group of exhibits. It's number 13. And this is a picture that's taken of the existing road up there. And I'm not offering this in any way to suggest that the city should do something about this condition of this road, but I'm really offering it for one simple purpose, and that is this establishes, this is my, my, my uh, I'm trying to think of the proper uh, legal term here, this is my shining example of, that I'll use in court if I have to go to court, that the city has accepted this road as a public right-of-way because the city has expended money and has improved this road and it has over the years. We have newspaper clippings about former uh, uh, public works director Paul Dahl. Uh, Dusty probably doesn't know Paul Dahl. <coughs> he was gone before, as in deceased, before you ever came to Spearfish. Paul Dahl quoted in the paper about going to put a flagpole up there, going to improve the road, we're going to do this and do that. And over the years the city has done some of that. And that is, under the law, an acceptance of the public right-of-way and the public nature of this road. And as a public road, you can't put a gate across it. You just can't do that. You can't deny people access to a public road. Think of it this way. What's the likelihood of Spearfish putting a gate across St. Joe Street and, 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 and restricting people's access to go up and down that street? It's no different than that. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to sit down. As I said, we're not here to ask that you go in and pave this road and do those types of improvements to it. We're asking you to do two things. One, take the gate down, and two, just maintain the road. A gravel surface is fine, but don't restrict people's ability to use it to access not only the Thone Stone Monument, which has great historical value and is a great tourist attraction, but it, don't restrict people who own land beyond that from using that road, which is their only access to their property. And I might just make one other comment about the access to the Thone Stone Monument. I, I know that there's a sign up there that says for people with um, handicaps or disabilities, they can call the city and someone will come up and open the gate. I'm not sure that complies with the ADA, folks. Um, I, I just don't think it does. Yeah, I know it hasn't been an issue yet, but it might become an issue. And I think you need to keep that in mind because a person who doesn't have the ability to walk very far, or maybe they're in a wheelchair, they don't have the same right of access to this monument, this city park, that those of us that can walk in do. And that might be labeled as discriminatory. The ADA would, would address that, I believe. So I've, I've shared with you the thir these 13 exhibits. This is, that's our case in chief. Um, if, you know, and I, I'm a lawyer, so you know, people ask me, well, what are you going to do if the city doesn't, doesn't agree to come around? And, and I've made it very clear that I won't have any choice but to bring a, a legal a, a lawsuit. You know, just be candid with you. And when I, if, when I have to do that, I'm going to have 14 exhibits. These 13, and one more. And I, I hesitate to even tell you what it is because I don't want it to come out wrong, but I, I just want to be transparent with you. It would be an affidavit for my attorney's fees because I will intend to try and recover those from the city of Spearfish. And I think I've got a case to do that, but I don't want to do that because that doesn't serve anybody's purpose. So I'm just hopeful that the city will find its way clear to take the gate down and, and do, just maintain the road so that the people, the, for the people's benefit, for whose benefit it was originally dedicated. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Thank you. Mr. Kelly. Thank you. My name's Les Turgeon. I'm uh, former eight year at Spurfish. Uh, graduated from school. Uh, in my last two years uh, at college, I worked on the Fairfish Police Department. Uh, graduation, I was offered a teaching job and the chief of police job. Talking over my family, we decided we'd try the teaching job. So I'm familiar with things around here and I've watched things for a lot of years. I've taught for five years, my wife taught for 29 years, and I was in business for 20 years watching a lot of things going on. And all we're trying to do, I asked Roger to come here tonight because 
1953, we've had so many different mayors and city councilmen that I wasn't sure how many people really had a good background on it, and that's what we're trying to present here tonight. When they surveyed my property, <coughs> it was done by Randy Dyer, who I believe is the chairman of the Orange County Commissioners now. It says right up here as it comes into the city, uh, existing public right-of-way document plot 2012-5296. And that's as far as you had to survey because from there on it was a public access. What we <coughs> have here is a major subdivision. According to the city ordinance, anything over four lots in a subdivision is a major subdivision. And if you look at 5296, there's five. And so it's a major subdivision which requires that every lot be provided that equal and a fair access to a known public road <coughs> or highway. And that meets your city ordinance. And uh, by locking a gate, you're denying that very access that's required. <coughs> We've been, uh, and I would guess that um, when you look at 5296, it says dedicated. In your city ordinance read that dedicated, <coughs> this is off of chapter 15A, dedication shall mean the designation of formal transfer of land to the government body for use by the public. So <coughs> by your own definition, that dedication, and a public right-of-way then is the public's right to unhindered access over that road right-of-way. And so everything lead to the fact that it should be open, you shouldn't have to worry about access to it. Now Roger mentioned some newspaper articles and I spent quite a bit of time in the library looking up the old newspaper articles on it and one was from Paul Dahl back in 1972 where he said that they would be doing a lot of work on the road, put up a flagpole uh, and pointed out that due to the, that agreement they signed that they had to maintain the roadway. It's kind of interesting because in 19 or in 2010, at the city council meeting, it was pointed out that since the patch may closed, and that was in 2008, the gates have been locked, and the local visitors and, and people have been complaining about the use of it. Cheryl Johnson on it explained that the monument of property three acres was given to the city to maintain as a city park by the Thompson family and if not utilized for that, will resort back to the Thompson heirs. She went on to explain that the long-term goal of the project is establishing a parking lot, installing some benches, and a flagpole. So since 72, up until the present day, there's still no flagpole there. So the question is, did it ever really become a city park? Uh, she was going to work on the road, establish some better grading, and add some more signs uh, at Jackson Boulevard, which there is one. And so it's kind of interesting, in 1968, the city found out that there was $500 left in the kitty for the Thornstone Road, and it became a big issue to move it down on Main Street. And when a person uh, turned in 360 signatures against it, and the article gets quite interesting as you read it, uh, the uh, Snappers Club came up with the money to pay for the stone. Uh, Mr. Thompson purchased the land for it and requested him, was followed by the city of Spurfee, to grade and gravel the road for him. And in 1972, he reported in the Queen City Mail that he was having over 20,000 visitors a year to come up to the monument. And he had had a deal at the Passion Play that when people would get their tickets to the Passion Play and ask what else to do, he would, they would send him up to the Passion Play. Now, I don't know how many of you knew Mr. Thompson, but he was run on crutches and he drove an old international pickup and he carried these crutches on the outside of his mirror. And he wrote a book on it and he would sit up there and sell books and tell people about the history of it. But he passed away in 72, or 75, excuse me, so in 71, 72, he started transferring the land to the city and the right of ways into his sons and daughters. And state law reads, uh, the Thompson bought that back in about uh, 2000, or, excuse me, 1909. So that right of way has been 
furnishing the access to his ranch for somewhere in the neighborhood of 110 years. And so when you look at the state law 43-25-30, all easements and right-of-ways transfer with the land. They go with the land. So when you buy the land, when the city got the land, the transfer was shown on the stone stone addition, it went with the land. And so when Donna and Guido bought the ranch, the right-of-way went with the land. And they owned all that land, so to get everything straightened up, and they were getting ready to sell it and cut down on themselves, they created a public right-of-way. So you have to ask yourself, what is a public right-of-way? And it is the fact that you do that so you can guarantee access to all the lots forever. And locking the gate is in violation of all those actions taken on. Also, one other thing or two I'll carry here is the city vacated all the other streets and, and alleys in that addition. And there's a four list of them. And if you look at your map here, city map, of your different ward where you represent, you can see the Stone Stone Road comes right up to the city limits, and that's where it stops. So they vacated all the other streets and alleyways, and then adopted Stone Stone Road to be the only access to the Stone Stone property, or and the monument and all the acreage in there. In 19, uh, or excuse me, 2017. When the wards were trying to sell that property and they were been having trouble for years to get access to it, the Black Hill Title Company informed the city of Spurfish that because of the two documents, one signed in 1953, or excuse me, 1971, and the 5296, that the title company could guarantee access to it. And if they were asked, they would guarantee access to it. And so they have done that. And so that is a contention on their part. Now, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but in the process of this back in uh, 17, the city of Spurfish prepared a document offering us a private easement over the road under certain conditions, which definitely uh, I couldn't sign, nor would I let Johanna sign. But in the first page on there, Excuse me just a second here to get this twisted right direction. The city acknowledged, and this is by the city, that the vehicle trail presently designated the Thone Stone Road has been in existence and <coughs> providing access to the Delavecchia property and the city property for decades. And true of about 110 years. And the Delavecchia, they conveyed, recently conveyed the Turgeon problem to the Turgeons. And as I said, 43, 25, 30, that is a right of way to the land. And that they wish it to grant the Turgeon an easement to the Thone Stone Road. And it's interesting because it's a nine page document, and I'm sure it's on file with the city, so I'd probably just recommend that if you've got any questions about it, go read. It uh, admitted that they fight at a gate on the road simply to keep the vehicles off the Thone Stone Road. And from the attorney that they had before, they declared it to be a 70-foot pedestrian trail. And if you look at your master plan, Surface Master Transportation Plan, it does not recommend as a present or a future master, as a pedestrian trail. So, in all, we just come here with the idea that they try to catch up with everybody on deal and ask you to follow through and open the gate and, and let us have access to it. Now I do know there was some suggestions the other night on the problem with the Stone Stone problem with the public, but there's a lot of different issues that can be settled at. Like I, uh, Roger tells me that one time there was a suggestion of putting an electric gate up, well we can move the electric gate. There's a possibility of putting up street lights. And they've got cameras anymore, so they can, when it comes on, they can visualize what's going on there. So there's a lot of issues that can handle that without locking the gate and everybody out of their land. And you know, so with that, I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Church. <coughs> Good evening, uh, 
Mayor and City Council. My name is Mark Weber and I live at 229 St. Joe. I'm the very last house on St. Joe before you get to the Thone Stone Gate, which is in question. Um, I do have a letter from Steve Birds. Uh, he's a neighbor. He wanted me to bring it. I do have copies of you. So, he couldn't make it because he had to work. So, the work is. I appreciate you guys allowing me to, to voice my opinion and concerns. I've lived there at, at the house or 229 St. Joe for 27 years. It's quite a few years and I've seen a lot throughout the whole entire year. The, the gate in question to the phone stone uh, was erected by Frank Thompson. There's no question about it. There's no question about its public access as well. A little bit of the history, uh, Frank Thompson and Joseph Meyer, Joseph Meyer obviously started the fashion, Black Hills Fashion Play, and Frank Thompson and him, uh, when they put the Pellet Stone up there, it was for tourists to go up and look. And it was great, not only tourists, but for the cities, uh, citizens of Spearfish. So it was a great, great deal, and for many, many years it was that way. I worked for uh, George Thompson, uh, Frank's son, in 1975. And one of my jobs, first jobs, and I hated it, was I had to clean up the garbage, I had to collect the money from the money box, and there was a flag on top uh, at the monument. Um, I did that and once a week, we gave money to the city. But in doing that, every night, the gate was locked. And from Memorial Day through Labor Day, it was, it was open only during the day because of the passion play. The rest of the time, it was absolutely locked up and there was no uh, nobody could go up there. Uh, they didn't even have, uh, it wasn't open to the public at that time. And we didn't have the tourists, obviously, in the winter like we do in the summer. All the adjacent landowners over the years, Frank Thompson, George and Katie Thompson, Jerry and Yvonne Breeding, Guido and jo Johanna Delavecchia, they all agreed that gate should have been there. If not, they would have taken it out. And the reason they knew that it needed to be there is because of the vandalism that happens to the Black Hills Passion Play currently in Alabama Theater, owned by Rand Williams. It's terrible. It happens. So they kept that gate there. We knew. And he, he, um, he knew if, it, if he took it out, he had vandalism up above at, at the cabins as well. Nobody has ever intentionally denied any access to anybody at any time, whether it be the landowners or the city. The city, in fact, has created, since they took it over in 17, has created even more of a public access than it ever has, owned by uh, Guido and Johanna Del Vecchio. Uh, so when the, when the Del, Del Vecchios purchased it from Katie and George Thompson, uh, at that time, the, the Turgeons knew that gate had been there, and it, as they said, it had been there for years and years and years. Uh, nobody again has ever been denied access to that. Uh, the city has posted that sign that Roger was telling you about at the bottom. Now I know for a fact that people have called, and I've let them in, handicapped people, buses, bus tours, whatever, they, they've opened up the gate and they've been able to go up there. No one's ever said, no, you can't, or even had an issue with it, ever. So, uh, that's, the, the people that are going up there now, walking, visiting, really like it. They park below, they walk up, they can let their kids run up there, they don't have to worry about any traffic. I've talked to them. The water, old water tanks included in that, and it's very nice. Here a few years ago, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, they had to board up the water tank because of the vandalism people getting into it. 
That's a historical thing, just like the phone zone. However, if that gate ever comes down, the problems that we have at the gate, and I can tell you per firsthand and personally what it's going to do. There is many, many calls and many arrests at that gate. Anywhere from DUIs, alcohol, drugs, people having sex, vandalism, trespassing. Wherever they can get to, they're going to vandalize it. They're going to do whatever they have to do. So the fireworks is one of my main concerns. And we've had fireworks. It's a great place to set them off. However, at the fields and the dryness, we've had two fires up there. And because of where we live and the neighbors, those fires were contained and put out immediately. Can you imagine having a fire at the top of the phone zone? It would probably destroy Mount Plains, destroy a lot of property, now BC Booth Association. Uh, it would it'd be pretty catastrophic. Uh, Again, uh, the Turgeon's while buying this property knew that this is the way the landowners wanted this. If the landowners themselves wanted to get rid of the gate, they would have. They never did. They never ever came to the city. And I've never heard anybody ever complain. And I'm up there a lot. I, I feed a lot of livestock and I'm up there almost every day. And I talk to a lot of people during the summer, winter, and not one person have I ever encountered that said that uh, they wish that was gone. So with that, with that, uh, the, the phone zone is like a sanctuary for, for the residents and people coming in. Again, they, they put in, the city had put in a gate, easy access, and that was back when, uh, when the passion play was uh, shut down. Cheryl Johnson put that in. Uh, her and Guido helped that go. They, they went in, uh, to make it easier access. That picture, uh, Mike, of the road, I don't know if you can bring that back or if you know where that's at. That happened this year. And the reason that happened this year is because we all know how much moisture we had, and the rains that came down were treacherous. That road, has only looked like that for a little bit. I have called and I've talked to Dusty about it, and there wasn't a problem. They were going to fix it. They're going to. Uh, they've maintained. The city has maintained this road ever since I've known and ever since I've lived there. Um, they mow up and around the the thumb stone. They mow it. They keep it clean. They pick up the trash. They're always up there during the summer because it's a nice mine. So that road there only became this last rain, which was in August, maybe September. That's the only, that's that when that happened. So I don't think it's fair to say that this is the way the road looks. It doesn't, and it hasn't. That road has been maintained. Uh, they, they put that chipped asphalt. That's the best thing they could have done. Very, very nice. So with that, I don't know if anybody's got any questions for me. Other than that, I, I'm very opposed to opening the gate. Just because of the vandalism that's going to happen up on top of the hill, um, the, the, the garbage, the party, and the, the kids, the rapes, uh, you, you name it. I could about I can go on and on and on. You know, we, we have so many sex condoms, beer cans, beer bottles, you name it. Food, Dairy Queen, Burger King, they just throw it out. The neighborhood. We walk up there, we pick it up because we're proud of the neighborhood and we want to keep it nice. We don't want to lose that sanctuary or, or that uh, the whole uh, <coughs> stone area. We don't want it to be destroyed. And I don't think the city wants it to be destroyed. But uh, it is. It's a, it's a right of way. Nobody's, nobody's denying that, that it's a right of way. And it's always been a right of way. And nobody's ever denied that access. So uh, with that, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Anyone else? Johanna? Uh, uh, just very quickly sure. before Mrs. Del Vecchio speaks, I, just, I have to address a couple of things that Mark said. This monument's been there for 66 years. It's been there longer than anyone on this council has been alive. And it's only in recent years that there's been a gate at the front end of that road. 
if, if Mr. Weber's concerns about the vandalism and the sex parties and all that stuff at the monument is a big concern, I think it's a big red herring, but if it's a big concern, fence the monument, put a gate at the monument, keep people from going into the three acres that are there, that's fine. Just don't restrict access to the public road. By his own admissions, the city has been maintaining that road for years. The gate that Frank Thompson put on was because he had cattle in there. That was before he subdivided it and transferred it to Joseph Meyer. There's a fence that runs the entire length on the eastern side of that road now. And that picture, ladies and gentlemen, that's from 2018. Not this year. 2018. So, I, I know that Mrs. Del Vecchia is here and she can speak for herself and about her access to her own property beyond the Thonestone Monument. Um, but, you know, I think it's a sad commentary on, our, on, on the people that live in this area to suggest that if you take that gate down, there's going to be condoms strewn all over and there's going to be sex parties and there's going to be beer drinking and rapes. I heard rapes going on up there. That's not what he's proposing. Uh, he's suggesting that's what will happen. No, he's going, he is going on the record of what we have. No, he's suggesting that's what you're going to have if you go back and listen to the tape. And he, nonetheless, I don't want to argue with yeah. you. I like you. But yeah. The thing is, you know, it's a sad commentary to suggest that that's what's going to happen if you do what you should have not done in the first place, and that is to, if you leave that fence up, that gate up, it restricts access to a public facility, a, a public road that people have a right to use. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Johanna Meyer de la Vecchia. Um, it is true that we uh, own this property uh, for a number of years before selling it to Rand Williams. But um, beyond, just beyond the Thorn Stone, is the gate to my continuing property, which is extensive. And uh, 40 acres of that was uh, recently sold to the Turgeons uh, so that they might have um, a cabin up there. Um, we do have livestock uh, in that pasture, um, both uh, horses and during the summertime cattle. And so that uh, is of concern. Also to me is uh, of concern is the fact that the road is not properly maintained. Um, I think that the uh, addition of not what it's called, but uh, asphalt-like paving uh, contributed to its current um, state. I think in maintaining a gravel road there, that's much easier to uh, for everybody to maintain and does not uh, suffer the damage that uh, a paved road does with drainage. Uh, I would suggest that we might search for uh, something which is uh, <coughs> agreeable to both parties, uh, which does not lay blame uh, on the city of Spearfish, uh, nor on uh, the various landowners who are uh, adjacent to this road. There is no question that it is a public right-of-way, that the public is entitled to go up there. Uh, I would like uh, it to be available to the public uh, under all circumstances. I also do understand very clearly the uh, concern for vandalism. The years that we had the passion play there, and that was a constant um, occurrence for us. It's something that we had to deal with over the years. Um, and certainly uh, for the people living uh, in the access in the neighborhood of this road, <coughs> that is uh, a very, um, very logical concern. Um, unfortunately, uh, we are aware of the fact that um, unattended areas uh, have become uh, playgrounds for the young, and they are not always responsible in its, uh, its use or its upkeep. Um, I can understand the desire of 
the city to maintain the gate there. Um, and I feel that a gate uh, is a possibility, but I also um, do not like the idea that it is a locked gate uh, that provides difficulties for um, access for those of us who own land up there. Uh, and also uh, for legitimate visitation of Stone Stone Monument. I would hope that we could find some equitable solution uh, which, uh, by which the city maintains the road, maintains access to the Thorn Stone Monument, uh, but still continues to protect the rights of property owners uh, in that area. I'm in the uh, unfortunate position of supporting both of these uh, requests. Mm -hmm. And so I would hope that somebody might come up with a solution which would be equitable to both parties. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Actually, if I may add? approach, I oh. would like to. Is that okay? Good evening. I'm Sarah Beverly. We live at 236 St. Joe Street. Um, I think it's really important to maintain a tone of respect. It is true that there are major issues with vandalism and with unnoticed use of the area around the gate that is currently closed. Perhaps there could be a moderate in-between solution, such as locking the gate at night. Sarah, so could you um, just step in front of the microphone so they can hear you in the back? Thank yeah. you. Okay. Now you can hear me? Yeah, I think Do I so. need to repeat anything? No, not for us. I just wasn't sure that they could hear you in the back. So. Okay, thank yeah. you for <laughs> noticing that. Um, yes, we have had fireworks shot at the back of our house. Yes, when I go up there, with any guests, I have to say, watch your step, because you will probably be stepping over personal items. And that's the way I heard somebody put it so nicely, and they're full. If that's not clear enough, I can explain it further. I think we got it. Thank you. Okay. There are needles up there. There are humorous, humorous stories about when the neighbor's children were little. And mommy, daddy, why are they nude? Grab my children, come inside, honey, we'll take care of it. I just wanted to comment on that, that there must be a middle ground. Maybe the gate could be locked at night. And yes, it's clear that it is a public access by everything that you cited. That's all. Okay, thank you, sir. I'd just like to make one quick comment here, and I'd just ask you for one of the reasons that uh, you look at your city ordinance and Section 15A84 on access. It says the subdividing land shall provide each lot by means of a public street or way with satisfactory access to an existing public street. And by locking the gate, this is not a satisfactory access according to your own ordinance. It's a subdivision, a major subdivision, and I don't know if any of you can explain or tell me any other subdivision in any of the area you approved that's got a lock gate on it. Joe, have you ever seen one? Nope. And Joe Dunn, I don't know another <coughs> subdivision that's been approved by the city with a lock gate on it. Okay. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, anything to add, Ashley, or Mike? I'm not sure who. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the history of Thone Stone Road, which is very interesting, but it wasn't officially dedicated as a public right of way until the 2012 plat. And there are some provisions in state law that are important to take note of when considering the 2012 plat. And that's, first of all, that um, accepting a plat or approving a plat is not an acceptance of any streets or public grounds on that plat. Um, accepting or approving a plat doesn't require 
the council to open, improve, or maintain any streets or public grounds on that plat. Um, and that's important to keep in mind when we're thinking about the history, hearing about the history of this road. Um, the plat was a dedication of the public right of way. It wasn't an acceptance. The law forecloses that as a conclusion. Um, acceptance is done either by an official act of the council, which hasn't occurred, um, or by a sum of the council's or the city's actions that result in an inference that the city has accepted the street um, or the right of way as a street. And that hasn't happened in this case. That's the city's position. That's been the city's position all along in this matter. Um, maintaining the road as a pedestrian path doesn't make it a street. Um, and, and that's been our position with this. Um, the 1971 agreement giving the city the property on which the monument is located requires the city to maintain the right of way. Um, the, the conveyance of the lookout property requires the city to maintain the own stone road. And the city has been maintaining it as what it is, which is a pedestrian path with light, occasional vehicle travel, non-public vehicle travel. Thank you. Anything else? Okay. So, um, I can barely see your eye right there. It's, it's, a, it's a function of my height, not yours. I'd just like to yes. raise a question about the, the mayors that signed the agreements uh, in the past. Doesn't that have some official business uh, capacity? Did you want to answer that? I mean, that was that was just the course of business in transferring land. So, go ahead. those were the agreements transferring the land, and um, like I said, those agreements said that the city would maintain the right of way, and um, we've been maintaining it as what it is. Okay, thank you. So there has been a lot of information and a lot of exhibits. Thank you very much. Um, there will be no action on this tonight because we're going to uh, we will review it and um, and ponder for sure and um, come back to you on this. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Mm -hmm. I just very quickly, I I'd be happy to send you the stack of cases that I have that are directly contrary to your uh, legal counsel's opinion about acceptance. It's the fact that the city has improved this road. Our South Dakota Supreme Court has said on numerous occasions that constitutes acceptance, which then puts the city or the county, as the case may be, or township, as the case may be, on the hook to continue maintaining it because it's a public road to be open to the public. So well, that would see. be very kind of you. Please don't send us case law right now. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> I appreciate okay. that. And so um, I do feel the need to kind of do a public service announcement because we have some seniors in the room. Um, and so there's a lot going on with that. And I am sure you don't take Burger King wrappers up there. But just so you know, the, there is a police officer that lives right there by the Thumbstone entrance. So you might want to tell all your friends. Thank you. <laughs> so with that, we will move on to finance. Um, we have a public hearing to consider an application from Visit Spearfish for a malt, special malt beverage license for the 605 Black Hills Classic, and that's on September 12th from 2 to 10 at Lions Park. Um, let's see. Ashley, can you grab the... That's okay. Hi. Stop going on. Okay, so I will open the public hearing. There is no one wishing to speak, and so I will close the public hearing. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, next, we have approved application from Visit Spearfish for the special malt beverage license. For, is this the, just a different date? Oh, it's on there. Never mind. A public hearing to consider an application from Canada Salter with Pure Bliss DBA, a perfect 10 for uh, wine and cider license. Is there any? 
Okay, so I will open the public hearing. Um, there is no one wishing to speak, so I'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, and then item C, approve the following annual renewals for the 2020 liquor and wine licenses. Is there a Move motion? Approve. Second. Any discussion? I'm, I'm assuming these have all been reviewed. We don't. We uh, don't have any issues that we would, that would bring us to okay. recommend any denials to council with this list. Okay. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Motion carries. Next, approve a first reading, reading of Ordinance 1306. This is an ordinance amending the 2019 Appropriations <coughs> Ordinance, number 1291, of the Code of Ordinances, City of Spanish. This ordinance is a amendment where we're changing the uh, budget authority, moving budget authority from one department within the city into another department. There are two different funds involved. One is the general fund, the other one is second penny sales tax fund. All of these items have come before you uh, for approval at prior meetings, and this is just to rectify the budget, okay? Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, and then approve <laughs> first reading of Ordinance 1307. Um, this ordinance does supplement the budget for some various different departments. Uh, first one is the Wildland Fund for expenses that we had for the wildland um, assignments that the true that the crews went on. We also have um, some purchase of some equipment for that fund. Um, you'll see there is a budget amendment there for 600000 for the workforce housing land purchase. That's in case the closing happens this year. If that does not go through, that budget authority will not be used in other matters or in other means. Um, also, the second penny sales tax, we're amending the budget. Uh, we did receive the fire truck that was budgeted in 2018. We actually received it in 2019 and paid the final bill. So those funds were not expended in 18, they were expended in 19. A um, couple other ones, hospitality tax, we had some increased expenditures there for the event trailer that was approved by council early on in the year. Um, and then the cost sharing on the convention center parking lot and then the retail study, the Buxton study. Um, for a special park gift fund, we have a memorial bench that was purchased um, through donations that was not originally budgeted for. And then in the TIF funds, there are several items for the TIF districts. Most of them are increasing the authority because we saw larger increments received this year. And then the TIF 2 and TIF 3, those funds have been closed out. Um, that was the action of the council in 2018, and so we need to transfer the residual balance over to the general fund. Any other questions? I any questions from the council? Move to approve. Second. Any, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, next, adopt resolution 2019 23, a resolution to establish fund 295, the Safer Grant Fund. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, requesting the, to create a new fund for the Safer Grant. That the fire department has been awarded for the next four years. It's in good um, accounting standards to establish a separate fund so we can track the inflows and outflows of that grant expenditures or of the grant funds throughout the life of the grant. Um, Move to approve. Second. Okay, discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We have one more item because we amended the agenda. So oh, sorry. then I'll call you up. Uh, next, uh, we have a workforce um, workforce housing agenda item that was added. So, go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. 
Council, I'd like to request your authority to extend the deadline on our workforce housing RFP to December 31st. Daryl Prop has granted an extension, a 90-day extension on the due diligence period, uh, which puts us into a purchase agreement situation mid-March. And so this allows us to extend that deadline that coincided with the original due diligence period uh, on the purchase agreement. So with your permission, we'd like to extend that to 31 December. Second. Approved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Uh, human resources. Okay. 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 Brown for recruitment, retention, and training coordinator, grade 16, step one, the wage is $19.99 per hour, and this should be effective 12 2 2019. This is the position that um, the SAFER grant was approved for. Keith actually has worked for the fire department the last two <coughs> while and seasons, um, most recently serving as an engine, engine boss. Um, he was selected for this position due to his experience. Um, he has eight years as an educator, and then he has also done um, a lot of marketing for his own business. Okay. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call. Clark? Yes. Eisenbrun? Yes. Herman? Yes. Hodge? Yes. Jacobs? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. position through after some reorganization um, as going back to the rec center and working as a registration desk attendant and then after I guess some evaluation they had decided that um, her skills and um, uh, the ability to use somebody for some office assistant duties would best be used in City Hall so we added the office assistant to it and sent it back to Condry to be regraded he then graded the whole thing as a step 10 our grade 10 step one. So um, this basically would go back to the point where the um, campground closed on 10 one and pay her um, the office assistant rate of a grade 10 step one instead of the registration desk um, rate which was a grade seven. Okay. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion? Okay, roll call. Clark? Yes. Isaac Brown? Yes. Herman? Yes. Hodge? Yes. Jacobs? Yes. Claire B? Yes. Motion carried? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, planning and zoning. Approve a pre preliminary plat and variance for the Blue Star subdivision. Jane, are you going to go through those three different? Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, so location uh, about 700 feet south of uh, where Maitland Road makes the uh, turn to go to the west and on of Maitland Canyon. It's a 40-acre parcel. Uh, recently changed zoning in the county from its ag to rural residential status. Um, the applicants have requested a variance, uh, this is probably in question, a variance to allow for um, a, instead of a 66 foot public right of way, um, going to a 36 foot wide private road access easement. Um, that's point number one. Point number two is a variance to allow the grade to, the road grade to exceed 10% and Chief Deaver did go out and review uh, to make certain that we can get fire apparatus up um, that, that short section. And it's right in here, right after, if you go out there, you'll see the approach, and then the, <coughs> the initial ascent up this bluff. There's a, a, a ridge that runs sort of in this direction. And so rather than do a switch back and tight turns, it was, it was suggested that the 10% exceeding and that very short section would be acceptable. And so that has been reviewed. And then um, those are the two points of the variance uh, in, in um, approving the conditions of the plat. Also, the, the Planning Commission recommended that if the Council chooses to approve the preliminary plat of these two variances, that it only apply to the eight lots in the overall 40-acre development. It does not apply much for future development. So, in your motion, would you please uh, take a se have a separate motion on one, two, and three? Okay. And okay. just mention preliminary plat with the approval of etc. Thank you. Separate motions. So separate motions okay. for each. There you go. Move to approve the 36 foot wide private access easement. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. 
On the second item, uh, road grade to exceed 10%. Move to approve. Second. Any discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And on the third variance, um, eight lots within the 40 acre parcel. Move to approve. Second. Okay, and discussion. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, so item B, approve first reading of ordinance 1303. This is small wind energy systems and set a public hearing for December 2. Okay. Um, the primary features of the new regulations pertaining to small wind systems um, are the following. Systems must be less than 75 feet in height, a maximum of one and a maximum of two mounted systems per lot. This would be allowed only in commercial, industrial, airport, and DRD commercial districts. All systems must meet specific criteria to mitigate noise, shadow flicker effects, and that's the on-off um, kind of uh, visual effect that you get with especially the uh, horizontal axis if it's spinning type of system. And then all systems must have a setback uh, from property line at 1.1 times the height of the system. Um, these small wind systems are not going to result in uh, commercial wind generation or wind farms. We simply do not have the wind resources and spearfish for commercial production of wind energy. That's where you see it mostly on the South Dakota Prairie. But this allows for individual businesses to make a choice to go to this type of system. Um, Corn Ridge Gulf in the, in the past has, has asked for uh, us to visit this, and so this is the culmination of that particular effort. Um, this type of review would happen with the Planning Commission because they are charged with approving the conditional use permits. In the event that one of these would be appealed, it would come to you as you would sit as the Board of Adjustment to hear facts and, and review the, the particulars of the case. So um, this kind of wraps up the request that was made by the Council to examine this effort back in May. And happy to take your questions. All right. Do we have a motion? Move to approve first reading ordinance 1303. Second. Okay, and any discussion? Yes. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Madam Mayor. I just want to thank Jane and the rest of the Planning Commission. Um, I know that I was approached by a couple people about it, and I think it's good to have standards out there, and I think that they're happy with the way it went. So, so I thank you and everybody else for your work on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay, hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, motion carries. <coughs> Uh, next, approve an access easement um, agreement for the top shelf. Okay. Um, when the top shelf preliminary plat was created, we did a lot of discussion with the developers whether or not we needed a cul-de-sac to reach into this corner. And we felt that because of the size of the lots, uh, that it was more street than what was needed. So instead, we came up with the idea to do a access easement that would serve essentially a very large three acre lot um, in this location, a one acre lot here, and then a secondary lot. So this is the size of the lots, roughly three quarters of an acre, about an acre and a half, and then about an acre and a quarter. So these lots being the size that they are, we realized that it would just make much more sense in order for these to develop, to do a private uh, access driveway to serve them all. And that's really what this does. It just lays out the terms of that particular easement that's already been dedicated. Um, the owners are responsible for maintenance. Uh, they're responsible for removing their own snow. Garbage has to be collected here at the curb on top shelf. Um, we do have a water main easement, or I'm sorry, a water main in this easement that comes up to top shelf and it doesn't, it doesn't affect or impact our operations at all. So staff recommends approval. <clears throat> Move to approve. This was we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? second? Okay. Any discussion? Um, when this was originally discussed, that utility track was basically going to be a pathway mm -hmm. access for people. So, what's the status of that, and how is this going to affect that? The agreement here still allows the public to access down to the Tumbleweed Trail. We um, have to work with the Parks Department to uh, review that. It's going to be an unpaved path system, and the Parks Department uh, does need to look at that because initially we were going to have them pave the, I'm sorry, 
provide the dirt path, but the problem was erosion control, so we basically kept it with grass. And so now that that, air, that scar is kind of healed up from the construction of the water main, then we need to now look at the next phase, which would be to put a route down there and a surface that's going to make some sense that works okay. with trails. So we'll be working with Tyler and the park staff to establish that. But if this goes to somebody's private driveway, then that path would be on somebody's private driveway mm -hmm. for a short section. Yeah. And the and the easement does uh, this agreement does permit uh, the public access to that particular route. Okay. It, yeah, it does not it does not hinder it, and I can find it for you if you wish to read it. No, I I, I just making sure that that pathway is. Yep, we retain all of that. Okay, fantastic. Very good, thank you. Um, any other questions? Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you, Jana. You're welcome. Um, under Public Works, approve resolution 2019-24, a resolution to set fees charged by the city. Good evening, ma'am. <clears throat> this resolution will set uh, water, sewer, wastewater fees until uh, 2024. And it's based on the study that HDR did when they came up uh, about a month, month and a half ago and presented to you. Uh, in addition, the resolution also adjusts the uh, solid waste fees by a CPI of 2.4% and it removes some obsolete fees that we no longer offer, like a, a special event cleanout, uh, truck rentals, and then uh, six day pickups. Um, on average, we ran um, some numbers for around 5,000 gallons a month, which is what we typically see on average, and this all total uh, will increase by about $3.49 a month for the average uh, customer in city's village. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. And any discussion on those fees? All I, in favor say aye. Aye. Oh. I, uh, I guess with the, uh, with the solid waste, I kind of, after the HDR presentation, I guess I, I was expecting you to come back with a proposal for um, trying to push some of the commercial pickups to private enterprise or some of the other stuff. So what, what, I guess, what was your thought process there or discussions regarding trying, to, you know, because basically at the time you presented it as the truck's got to travel all over the place um, because of how the, some places have pickups every day and some places don't and all that. So we've taken a hard what, what are you going to do moving forward to address those? We've taken a hard look at solid waste pickup and over at the rubble site. And we think that with um, um, some better uh, routing, um, proper staffing, we have our trucks up and running that we can do everything that we planned on doing right from the very beginning to make it profitable. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor <coughs> say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next, uh, approve future and current employee wages to the following rates to more closely match competitive existing wages across the state and be effective 1117. Yes, ma'am. Um, what we uh, propose is to uh, set a new uh, starting point there for the water, sewer, wastewater treatment, uh, solid waste. Uh, operator baseline and the solid waste collection baseline. We obviously have a um, tremendous talent pool here with us and we want to keep them with us. And then when we do need to recruit people, we want to be able to recruit the best um, that's out there. We went across the state and we surveyed what they pay their uh, comparable frontline employees. And um, this is uh, what we propose to city council to uh, keep our talent and recruit new talent. Okay, is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. And any discussion? Yes. <laughs> Dusty, this is probably for you. Uh, with this adjustment and then, you know, the nominal CPI adjustments we have every year, is this that going to be enough to keep, uh, I would say, attracting top talent? Or uh, do you guys see future? Hard to predict the future, increases. but it uh, it's good for the foreseeable future, for where we're looking right now. We, we didn't come in at the very bottom. We did on one of them, because um, that's all we could do. But I think that we're going to be competitive for a while. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, sorry. No, roll call. Roll call. Roll call. <laughs> sorry. <coughs> roll call. Clerk? Yes. Eisenbaum? Yes. Herman? Yes. Hodge? Yes. Jacobs? Yes. Clarenby? Yes. Thank you. Um, next is another roll call vote. Approve the bill list dated November 18th. Order <coughs> approved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Roll call. Clark? Yes. Eisenbrown? Yes. Herman? Yes. Hodge? No. Jacobs? Yes. Claire Beek? Yes. Motion carried. <coughs> All right. Thank you. Okay, mayor and council items. Council have anything to share? All right, not Park, Yes. Park and Rec met last week, and <coughs> um, Tyler went over the <coughs> the grant deal that they did in in Pier and showed a video of that, and it was kind of cool. Um, trying to think what else we discussed. One of them was uh, Optimus um, presented a presentation for putting the Winter Wonderland in the campground um, starting next year, not this year. But uh, it looked like a pretty neat plan, and I guess I look forward to seeing what they come up with that uh, I think would be another neat event <coughs> for speakers to have. Um, there are several other topics, but I can't read nothing that wasn't just regular stuff. So. Our, uh, Thank you, Mayor. Mm -hmm. A couple items I'd like to show Council. First is the <coughs> Mayor and staff worked on a metric to evaluate the proposals that we may receive for the workforce housing project so that we can stand in front of developers tomorrow at 1 and say, here are the things that are important to the city and here's what you'll be evaluated upon. So this is a draft. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more, I'll be happy to send it to you. Uh, this will score each proposal based on 100 points and it factors in things such as affordability, home amenities, the development aesthetics, and the developer and project risk. So they'll know before they submit their proposal to the city exactly what it is that is important uh, to in terms of evaluation criteria. Second, I would like to show you two things, uh, or this next drawing to illustrate one, the talent you have on staff, and B, show you something that uh, I'm very, very excited for. So Jaina put this together to show you not what will be on the parcel, but what could be on the parcel. And so this overlays a potential sports complex with affordable housing in the back. This provides uh, approximately 136 affordable housing lots, incorporates a mountain bike uh, area on the option, or excuse me, the land that is not currently under contract. So we would need to explore conversations with Daryl Crop if we were to engage in the mountain bike concept. Um, but that's in a, in a drainage area, not a particular attractive area in the development. It's something that's certainly feasible. So for the first time, we have a visual of what this project could look like. And we hope to show this to developers tomorrow to kind of guide the, the, the thought process in terms of what the city's thinking out at Exit 17. So. Great job to Jana. She put this together in a very short order, and it's it's just, in my view, absolutely fantastic. So, wanted to share that with the council. That's all I've got, right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you notice, they put in there's 136 lots there. So there's a lot in that. Um, so, thanks, Jana. Very good. Do you have anything to add, Jana? It's <coughs> my favorite thing to do in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley. Nothing. Okay. Michelle. Dusty. What you got for us? Wednesday's snow will probably be the last uh, event that we have a mixture of salt and sand. And then after that, we're going straight salt like the plan was when we bought that salt uh, way back in August. So Jody's car is going to be clean all year long now from, uh, well, the next snow after Wednesday. So we're excited I, I about I thought that. you were going to say that it was going to be the last event. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just going to pass on, I don't know if you saw Jody's email earlier, uh, Chief Jacobs' father passed away um, <coughs> last night, and I only bring that up because he was a 20-plus year employee of the city, uh, 
after his second career uh, prior to retiring. So just Friday to let you know that if you knew Howard Jacobs, the funeral will probably be Friday or Saturday. Okay. Uh, Chief Jacobs will be out the rest of the week. And okay. You can say you let me know if you need anything. Thank you. Chief? No, thank you. All right. So with that, we open uh, public comment. Anyone would like to speak? Thank you, know the rules. Try not to miss an opportunity to public speak. I think it's, it's always good. <clears throat> John Dale, 239 West Jackson Boulevard. Regarding the Bone Stone Monument, I didn't hear anybody say that the livestock can help provide some fire mitigation. So by grazing up there, you create economy out of the grass that would normally grow anyway, whether it's white-tailed deer or cattle. Um, I'm not sure how economical horses are exactly, but uh, I know cattle can be a good use of the land. So I didn't hear anybody say that. So I thought I would advocate for that uh, on record. So let's see. Um, I saw a video recently regarding the 5G and technology. Uh, someone disassembled one of the lights that was being installed in his township and verified through uh, examining the circuitry and power supply that it was indeed weaponizable, which leads me to an important point about the way that the computer industry does business. It wants to be interchangeable, so it makes form factors that allow plug and play. So if we're going to install the form factor of LED lights, then we need to understand that Dusty's organization is going to be a point of infiltration for people who want to do bad things, as is the software provider and uh, systems administrators of that system. So we need to make sure that they have an extra awareness of security because the way the form factors are put together, you can plug in weaponizable and weaponized devices. Um, I'm still looking for opportunities to participate in some kind of a committee or technology that might be overseen by the city. I would love to be able to do that. I have the credentials, qualifications, and experience to contribute in a positive way. Um, let's see, I think that's all I had. Uh, oh, regarding the surveillance solution for Thonestone as a, as a mitigator, obviously I would put some caveats on that in terms of how we plan to surveil the, the kids that are up there. So, anyway, all right. Thank you, John. Okay, so I know this is probably a stressful day for you all, so the, <coughs> the shelter will be open tomorrow, and I know people are probably going to want to go in and see Kitty and just hold them and feel better, but uh, that's a thing. Um, actually, I was coming to extend an invitation to everybody for the Pop Prince of the Snow. It will be held on Thursday, December 5th from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. There will be a, like a prize raffle, a <coughs> to raffle, and um, arts and crafts, but of course this year we will have pictures with Santa where you can bring your pets and your kids, or kids if you want to consider them all and one and the same. But, um, so that will be going on, and <coughs> it'll be at Kropi Brewery, and it'll be outside of Trust Farm, but we'll be offering like food, drinks, arts and crafts, all types of fun stuff. Very good. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Come on, high schoolers, no? Oh, all right, all right. So can I get, uh, oh, I'll close public comment. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So Move to approve. <laughs> Would you like to second? <laughs> second, Beth. <laughs> all in favor say aye. Aye. Right. We are adjourned.